Welcome back to Sebring, where we have rain reported on some parts of the track. A week from now, we will be bringing you, Speed Vision will be bringing you the Brazilian Grand Prix you see on your screen. Qualifying will be at 11 a.m. Eastern Time on Saturday. The race will be at 11.30 a.m. on Sunday. Of course, the first race went to the red cars of Schumacher and his new sidekick, Barrichello, and we will see if the red tide continues in Brazil or whether the McLaren team can reverse their engine problems and uh, become competitive. It looks like a tremendous season, and uh, whether or not Mr. Schumacher can finally succeed in winning the World Championship for Ferrari is very much up in the air. Well, McLarens always go very, very well in Brazil, uh, but um, the way the Ferraris were going a couple of weeks ago in Australia certainly looked much more competitive than they did this time last year. So I think we're in for a great season in Formula One. The grid was very close last week uh, compared to the year before. It was four seconds closer than it had been in 1999. So maybe we're going to see that throughout the year. Some good cars out there. Capello is now 29 seconds behind the team car that has now been driven by Piro. We do have more reports of wet weather and Calvin that will uh, have a tire. Wow, look at this. There'll be a tire scramble. There really will, Derek. I mean, if they have to come in, this could be the saving grace for the 78 car because if everyone has to change the wet weather tires, that'll mean they can come in and fuel at the same time. Yes, they'll be in the pits a little longer to put some fuel in, but everyone's going to have to come down pit lane slowly. So if it does start to rain, the wet tires are out here in the Yost pit right now. That means that everyone will come down. That could hand them the victory. It's really intriguing. And I did notice when Capello went out, he really lost a ton of ground to Piro on the first couple of laps, so he is having to adjust to that visibility issue. And of course, an interesting point we want to make here is that eight times in C-Ring history, the leader at the 11th hour did not go on to win the race. Eight times out of 47 races. That's well, 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 yeah. you believe that it might rain. I have to tell you, I, I threw in that well, well, well for Jackie Neal because we just got an email from her and said she needed a well, well, well fix. And now she has it. <laughs> Didn't we have any well, well, wells? I, all those incidents? I find it hard to believe that we haven't had a well, I well, did, well. Yeah. Uh, we had We had one in uh, Australia last week, with your honor. Yes, I, I, re I, I, did, I, did, I do remember that. <laughs> yeah, I do remember well, that. Well, well, well. On the occasion of the second Mercedes engine, evaporating yeah. the smoke. Well, the German engines do not seem to be doing anything but perform beautifully here today. They occupy first through fourth and uh, appear to have a lock on this race, uh, almost no matter what the rain does, but the rain is bound to reshuffle this race somehow. It's ironic and that one of the fastest guys in the rain in a BMW is J.J. Leto, and he's not even in the thing. And talking of uh, the German engines, there's no doubt about it that both Audi and BMW are on a tremendous roll here in North America. Their, their sales are way up, but of course Audi got a lot of great new models coming along, and this is just a sort of promotional uh, exercise they want to get into to, to try and promote those high-performance luxury cars they make. I just saw an imbalanced brake system on that car there. I think it was the 77. The rear discs were glowing. That shouldn't be. It should be the front discs glowing. Give another look here. Can't see it quite there. I think they've done that deliberately to take some weight off those front brakes, which are wearing faster, because he did say, didn't he, um, McNish said when he got out of the car that they had changed some brake balance, which wasn't the best thing to do, but it's the only way they could keep those front brakes going. Okay, here, this might be a telltale. Now, the yes, 77 is, car, driven by Capello, is losing about four seconds a lap to the leading Audi. We'll have more highlights as soon as we come back. Welcome back to the 48th annual running of the 12 Hours of Sebring, the Exxon Superflow 12 Hours at Sebring. Welcome to Speed Vision's extensive and unprecedented 13 hours live coverage of this classic event. For those of you just tuning in for the last half an hour, you're very welcome. We're going to show you the highlight package of all the action of the day. This was a mad scramble into turn two. Corvette on board, loses, locking up rear brakes. This was Chris Neifel on board. This was Dorsey Schrader.
tire problems on that Lola uh, with uh, Porsche power. Bill Oberlin trips over one of the Vipers, breaks the suspension of the Viper, gets away with it. This is one of the Panos cars, disappeared early, throttle problems. Moved on to hour number three. Alvareto almost hit the tow truck. He was leading at the time. And then the Panos moved into the lead with David Brabham behind the wheel. They were to have trouble later on. This was the scary one of the day. And he was hit the wall at 175 miles an hour. David Donahue goes off. Panos in big lead trouble. Both cars disappeared. Alvareto blew a right front tire and you can see the resulting body damage. BMW major engine failure, GT car gone. One of the GTS cars in trouble, however they repaired it and still ran. Ongoing troubles for the number 38, the new Lola with uh, Porsche power. And this is another incident where Gunion in the BMW didn't see the panos and just gets a little whack. Got away with that too. Hour number eight. Darkness beginning to fall. Right front gone, another GTS Viper. And the Audi takes the lead again in the number 77 car, while the sister car is in trouble with brakes. Then the BMW gets into the similar braking trouble. New discs and new pads. Alan McNish in the darkness almost throws the lead car away. 11 hours in, Bob Wallach breaks a right rear suspension end of Dick Barber's challenge for a 1-2 in the GT class and then McNish brings the car number 77 in in the lead his teammate gets in Capello and he almost trips over Wayne Taylor this happened only 10 minutes ago and since then he has developed more and more braking troubles he is falling further and further behind the lead car driven by Piro in that Audi. They are 1-2, but the second one is a bit of a lame duck. He is not able to maintain the leader's pace. Nor has the rain, which uh, you saw on the lens uh, just about five minutes ago, materialized. Uh, it's uh, passed over, apparently. The track is drying again in the places where it was damp and creepily. The rain tires are still out, but uh, do not head it appear to be headed for use. Boy, I used to absolutely hate that. You'd see raindrops on the windscreen in oh. the dark, and you go rocketing off into the pitch black out the back of this track here. Raindrops bouncing off the windscreen, you wonder what the heck you're going to see around the next corner. <laughs> of course, being dark, you have absolutely no idea what the cloud cover was up there. Just uh, never did like that much at all. Le Mans was the same, of course. And of course, raindrops. all you know about the track is that it's oily. Yeah. Uh, from the tw almost 12 Perfect hours combination with a bit of wet weather. Yeah. 341 laps completed in over 11 hours. There are six P cars still running reasonably strongly, certainly the top four are. Then you go to the GTS cars, one, two, three, and they're all Vipers. GT car, GT class still lit, led by Dick Barber's car. That's the Mueller and Lure car, that's the junior team. And David Murray and Johnny Molum are second in the GT class. They are 11th overall as we speak. A word about the Vipers, uh, I want to get your reaction, uh, Derek. I, I think we're looking at one of the most remarkable racing teams in, of modern times, endurance racing teams. Uh, this Orica Viper group has taken a car, uh, admittedly one well suited to racing in the first place, but they have made it a, a, a fantastic weapon for winning races. And remember, we are seeing that car in its well-sorted form because it has lived for the last three or four years in Europe just mopping up the GT class wins over there, won three FIA championships, won their class at the Le Mans 24 hour race, and then come over here and do something that was unheard of almost to win the Daytona 24 hour race in a car that really didn't have the speed of the, uh, of the uh, prototype racing cars, but they all fell to pieces. And they won all six ALMS races. I mean, in other words, sprint races, long races, Races on weird tracks, Absolutely. races on classic tracks. Absolutely. It didn't seem to matter to these guys. They are reliable, they are fast, and they just run like trains the whole time, despite the fact that the drivers complain but they are so hot inside. Remember, they are all carbon fiber, which retains an enormous amount of heat 
from that engine in the front. They and also the have a is, tremendous driver lineup. Of course. Yeah, but the key is that it was a car built around an engine, a V10, fabulous engine, which John Caldwell has prepared fabulously, absolutely without flaw. And uh, that's given them that bedrock sense that they, they just don't have trouble in the engine department. I know John Caldwell very well. He was the man that built the engines for our Nissan in the heyday of GTP racing. And they didn't break down either. <laughs> they didn't break down either. <laughs> hmm. John Caldwell does a miracle to me, of course, they can make a gearbox that lives behind that huge V10 engine in those Vipers. The, the torque those things develop is absolutely awesome. clutch of traffic there, just what you don't want. Uh, raindrops bouncing off the windscreen and a whole bunch of traffic going through this tight infield. Again, no reference points. Bit of light on that one uh, shown on the scene. There's somebody else with only one headlight too. Maybe he could get together with Capello. This is when the fatigue, you start to feel it just a little bit. We have 93 car there spewing out tons of brake dust off those giant discs they have at the front of these cars. 66 car there running in uh, 20th spot. So the freight train of the Vipers continue to run. They'll never catch those Audis, but they have been impressive. There's our GT leader, number five, the Mueller lure car. That is Dick Barber, the Barber of Sebring returns here with probably some of the best prepared cars we have ever seen here but the Porsches have been so strong in the GTS and GT category and when we come back we'll be joined with one of the most successful long distance racers in America Hurley Haywood he has won here many times it'll be interesting to get his perspective on what we see today The Exxon Superflow 12 Hours at Sebring is sponsored by New Speed Stick Ultimate, Antibacterial Odor Protection, Kills Odor, Protects Guys, by BMW, the ultimate driving machine, and by Pirelli and your local Pirelli retailer. Welcome back. We have followed the progress of the car number 77. Have a look at this here. When he goes out of your shot, he loses it. David, they should never have taken Alan McNish out of this car. No, no, in a minute, I could, I mean, I had exactly the same thing happen to me in the Nürburgring, 1,000 kilometers in 1990, uh, 1984. I was driving with Thierry Bootson. He ran the car almost into the ground, no brakes, and in the last 45 minutes, they made me get in the car. It was absolutely undrivable. Look at this. Look at this. He's got his helmet. They may be discussing putting Alan Nish back into this thing here. He hasn't got time, has he? Calvin Fish is down there somewhere. No. I don't know whether he has enough time. Well, he's not going to be able to do it. But he has he his helmet with it. him. But you know what? I think they're just hoping he can hang on to that second place. That's where Nish. Who's this? Alan, I see you getting your helmet here. What's the situation with the car and Capello in the car? Sorry, I didn't hear you. What's the situation with the car right now? Capello seems to be losing a lot of ground to the other car. Yeah, I think that he's having a bit of problem with the brakes. Um, I'm not getting my helmet ready. I'm just getting it ready to pack up and put it in the truck. My day's done. Obviously, you had to change tyres. You'd got three stints on those. You needed fresh tyres. Could they not have kept you in the car? Nah, well, I was a bit tired, you know. You have to work out there. You remember that, Calvin. It, well, going out there, he hasn't been out in the nighttime driving. It's a little drizzly out there. You've got one headlamp, you've got braking problems. In retrospect, you were in a rhythm. Would it have been better to keep you in, do you think? Yeah, but you, I don't think so, because Dindo's a very, very capable driver, and uh, he's won many, many races. He can, he can drive the car just as well as I could. OK, well, fingers are crossed down here that he can get it to the finish and win one for Alan McNish and everyone here for Audi. Well, you could see him there pump the brake pedal as soon as he went through turn oh, yeah, He's at it again. Just coming out of turn. Yeah, he is the last in trouble with, with the brakes in this Audi. Now, let me take a minute here just to welcome a guest, a special guest to our commentary position here, Hurley Haywood, who 
uh, by today has now started 28 times here at Sebring. Hurley, welcome. Thank you for coming up to join us. You've watched a little bit of this, and one of your comments was it's very slippery now. Yeah, it's the worst track conditions you can get because it's not really raining. It's just kind of sprinkling, and it makes the, the pavement very slick, and it's uh, difficult to contend with sometimes. When you have a Capello or uh, a McNish or, or uh, young drivers like this, you think they're at a disadvantage because they don't know the place as well as some of the seasoned veterans? Well, they're young, but they're certainly not uh, new to this kind of driving. Uh, they, they have tons of experience. They race a lot of times in conditions like this in Europe, so they're well-versed in this kind of situation. Hurley, your first victory came back in 1971. What was it like in the latter stages of that race, thinking you were on the verge of winning Sebring? Well, we had a pretty big margin uh, in, in 73, so we were just kind of coasting. The, these days, you just can't have that kind of a, a strategy. You've got to race full blast 100% the whole time, and uh, which is what we're doing. We're in third place, and we've been, it's, a, it's a, been a dogfight all, all 12 hours so far. Yeah. Wow. How about the uh, change in the sport uh, in that 30 years? Oh, it's, a, it's enormous. I mean, the, the professionalism, I, I was talking to somebody, I thought that this Sebring uh, that's running today has been, I mean, a great race, and the driver cal caliber is just phenomenal. The, the guys are staying out of each other's way. There's been no really bad accidents, and that's a testimony to uh, the, the drivers here. And of course, back, you know, in those days, you'd have like two minutes from the front to the back of the field. I mean, today, it was only about uh, 25 seconds. Yeah. It covered the whole field. I mean, that's everything. GTS, GT, and the prototype cars. I mean, and these guys have all been driving absolutely flat out all day. Yeah, and, and when you have cars that have such a disparity of, of speed, when you can group all those guys together and, and still have a you know, successful time, it's quite a testimony to everybody. Hurley, after all these years, and all the success, do you still get bitten by the book to continue with some of the aggravation that's associated with competing? Well, I, I mean, I love competing and, and I love driving Porsches. I'm, I'm glad that uh, I, I'm driving a Porsche here. Uh, you know, it's in third place. It, it's kind of, we're not going to be able to win our class, but third's better than fourth, I guess. So I love racing, I love Porsche, so I'll, I'll be back as long as they'll have me. Let's just show you a little piece of video here that you might recognize some faces from the past. And maybe you can talk us through <laughs> some of these, uh, the years. Boy, that's a, well, that's 73. But that, that, when we won with uh, an RS, Peter, and myself, that's Hanstuck. This is the Can-Am days with, I had a 917-10. That's all Mark down here there, George Fulmer. David Hobbs. David oh Hobbs. David with hair. <laughs> Something. <laughs> Jody Schechter. Uh, yeah, and there, you know, the heat still got me way back then, I guess. And, and, is that and Peter Gregg? And today, the 911 is still the car to beat in most of these endurance races. That's a well, my, my famous license plate. You still have that? No, well, I've, I've retired it. Too many people want to play race car driving on the street when they see that. See Sam Posey there. Oh, Lord. BMWs. Sam, you drove a BMW. Yeah, I loved it. This is a great 935, the at, Brumos 935. At Daytona. That was a great car, those 935. It was a great car. You've had a great career. We hope to see you for many years to come. Still with a smile on your face. And you still look so young. He looks old with the same. You said that hair look any different, did he? Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. It's pretty scary, that. Early. Right. Thanks, guys. Did you see that, boys? Let's have a look at replays on that. This is the leader. Locks up the rear brakes. Locks up the rear brakes. Well, this is the point that Hurley has just been making, is that the pace, even this deep into the race, is exactly what we said it would be at the start. This is a 12-hour They've only got race. 22 minutes to go. Yeah. It is amazing. It never gets easy, does it? And, and, and now these conditions are absolutely the worst because they're locking up the brakes. It's slippery out there. These cars don't have ABS brakes. They just got regular standard brakes. And it's so easy to lock up a wheel. I, in our GT3 car, we were locking the wheels up. And now you, you've got a little bit of, of rain. It makes it even easier to lock them up. How do you compare the new, the modified course with the old course? Well, you know, the old course had a lot of character. But these cars now are so are so fast that uh, you have to make these kind of modifications for safety reasons. So 
you know, it's taken a little bit of the character away, but it's a, it's a, a much safer racetrack, and that's what we care about, safety on this high-speed circuits. What's the uh, track like? There seems to be a tremendous amount of rolled-up rubber off-line. Off I mean, if you get off-line, I mean, you're yeah, right it, in the marble. Yeah, I uh, went wide on one corner. I forget which corner to let a whole group of... Uh, of the sports prototypes by and my god i mean it was like skating on ice so like driving on the beach it, yeah it's it's a one-line racetrack and when it's dark you know you can't you can't stray out there because you can't see it but i don't know what the reason why the, the tire build up and it's not only i mean it's huge chunks you know yeah. three and four inches in diameter i don't know where that's that stuff comes from but it's amazing I'm sure you're glad to see Hurley. Your car is still in the top three in the GT class. Her yeah, car we, got little, zero we, got three. Little, we got a little margin there. I think we got two laps, so we can just kind of. Thanks, Hurley, for coming to buy and see us as we right roll there. into the final 20 minutes of this race. The Audi still leads. The second one is in trouble. The BMW is a minute 11 seconds behind Capello. Can he run him down? Welcome back to Sebring and the leader, the number 78 machine driven by Manuele Piro, brings the Audi in for a final splash and go. I just spoke to Reinald Yost, he said it'll be about a 10 to 12 second fuel load here. They only have about 15 minutes to go, 20 minutes to go, so they do not need a full fuel load. And he had about a 70 second lead over the sister car, the number 77, currently driven by Capello. Looks like they're taking a little bit longer than the 10 seconds. Now they're off to fire it up. Good clean stop, and he stalls as he leaves. Fires it back up again, he gets in gear, and he's away. He should keep the lead, guys. You saw oh, Tom... A lot longer than 10 seconds. He was, that? yeah. Tom Christensen there was on the pit wall. He did a good... Uh, several good stints earlier in this car. But now he loses probably about 25 or 35 of those seconds of the lead that he had. But remember, the sister car is still in that brake trouble. Capello has tried three times at least to crash. Got away with them all. But right off the bat, when Frank Biela took that number 78 car into the lead and set a fast lap of 1 minute 50.2 and lap 151, they have not looked back since. Up until now, they have done 350 laps. We're going to keep our camera here to look back for the second place car to give you an idea. And there he is there. That's not that far behind, but he doesn't have the mechanical ability to drive that thing hard. He has to baby it and, and uh, pussyfoot it around to make sure he comes home in second place. There he is, pumping the brakes again. He's pumping them all the time, so his left foot there, hovering over the brake pedal, keeping the pads up to the, keeping the pads up to the disc. So a tough way to finish a race off. It is. So it's Piero Capello. George Mueller, and then the second of the BMWs. There's Tom Christensen. This is the leader in that haze, the leader of the P-Class in that haze somewhere there he is bouncing around that turn 17 up the straight just 15 and a half minutes left audi should they hang on and of course they are running one two to become the 14th make of car to win at sebring in all these years and if it stays at it as it is three different makes of cars will win the three different classes Audi currently lead the P class the Vipers lead the GTS class and in the GT class we have a Porsche 911 we usually see Porsches win their classes here in fact if the GT class runs as it is it will be Dick Barber's 20th anniversary um, of his last victory at Sebring 
And that, of course, was him driving with John Fitzpatrick. And the year after that, I drove with John Fitzpatrick here. And, of course, John tipped it on its roof, going into the hairpin on about the sixth lap. So. JJ later with trying some fresh fruit. Had the massage earlier on. Look at his finger still bandaged up. He got blisters uh, during practice and qualifying here. He had his wrists heavily taped uh, during his stints. You're a man for stats, Sam. If the, if the Audis win this race and come first and second, how many factory teams have come first and second in the series? Aha, uh -huh, I have absolutely no idea. Do you know this or do you want me to try to look it up? Uh, would I you like, like to look quite a few? Or would you like Rob Stewart to look it up? He's I'd been looking up for the Stewart. last 14 uh, hours. Straight. Indefatigable statistician who has never left his seat here for <laughs> all day. Of course, the white lights are for the uh, American style headlights. The yellow lights are on the Arica cars because, yeah. of course, it is a French team, French based team, so they don't go with the white headlights. They stick with what they're used to. And now you've got to roll out the last 15 minutes. It's funny how an event like this will reach a peak. Uh, and then a kind of end game sets in very suddenly and that you feel that uh, perhaps I'm wrong but you feel that peak was reached about 20 25 minutes ago with the rain and yeah. the uh, event uh, and Capello the, taking Capello over, taking and over. Yeah. it would seem now that we're in a settling down mode well I tell you if we have a settling down mode in this race uh, for the last seven laps there's about seven laps left uh, we won't have been short changed at all uh, today this has been the most spectacular race i think I've, I've seen almost ever just absolutely flat out all the way around there's bill Oblin. La the, the last lap we were seven, 17 seconds between first and second uh, that just not the day for the corvettes i i believe sincerely they will be back and strong at le mans this this track is as we've observed over and over so much tougher than the other two long distance tracks on the calendar the number three car fell out a long time ago he is classified as 24. um the brabham magnuson car fell out after 250 laps uh, david brabham led the race and led the p class obviously in that car and ran very strongly uh, for quite a few hours before they had mechanical trouble these are all Vipers. Oh, we're going to see One, a two, three. line abreast finish, I suspect, out of the Vipers. Boy, what a year for the Vipers, starting at Daytona. They won overall, and now this fabulous performance. 11 minutes, just over 11 minutes remaining. 13 hours of coverage live on Speed Vision. Now, if you think this has been a long day, we're not even halfway through what we're going to do for you on Speed Vision at the Le Mans 24 hour race because we're going to be on for that whole stint of 24 hours. We'll break away for a short time just to go to the live qualifying for the Canadian Grand Prix. But Speed Vision, unprecedented live coverage of sports car racing this year, as well as live, live coverage of everything that happens in Formula One on Speed Vision. So you got to line up your French cheese and your bottle of wine and your Coke. Uh, driver for the VCR so that you know if you fall asleep and you run out of tape someone else can step in and You'll place the new tape. Yeah. All the spare parts you would need. Uh, we might even take emails from Le Mans also so you can be in touch with us over there too. How will we do that? As we get tired. It's so now. far away. <laughs> <laughs> Long line. I still don't understand. All Long line. Yeah. There's the 87 car. They've had a fairly uh, troublesome day, one way or another. Robertson, Barbosa, and James. Porsche, here's the special. This is a good job here now. Remember, Kevin Doran's team fitted this V10 Judd engine to this Ferrari, came here without a single day's testing, just with fingers crossed and hopes and prayers, and this thing has gone remarkably well very reliable probably not as fast as he wants it to be but for the first day out i think they've done a great job to pull this car up to fifth place that looks like mauro baldi still behind the wheel didier Thay started that car freddie leinhardt then did some stints in the middle but there's a great job 
by the Doran Special. And you know less than 10 minutes to go. That car has never been out of the top 10. It didn't inherit fifth. It's run strong the whole way. Two Audis, two BMWs, and then the Doran Special, and a Cadillac still running in the top six. We're back. Derek Daly, Sam Posey, David Hobbs, Calvin Fish, and Alan DeCadene live at S Sebring on Speed Vision number five. Looks to be going very slow there. He is our GT leader. It looked as if he almost missed that corner. Dirk Mueller is behind the wheel. Tenth overall has led the GT class for most of the day in Dick Barber's car. Tony Dell leads this team. So well prepared these cars are. Everything is, everything they do. Oh, they're beautiful. It's shiny and clean and new. Oh, absolutely incredibly preparation on those cars. Lost one car, remember Bob Wallach behind the wheeler when the right rear suspension broke. Had about two and a half full 360s. Didn't do any serious damage, but did cause a full course yellow to go gather him up. Less than nine minutes to go less than nine minutes and notice the crowd still very much in place well from about the first time ever we have got some racing tomorrow to keep people in place so um, uh, a very full weekend here at Sebring races yesterday Trans Am race yesterday afternoon which was uh, an exciting event and uh, another couple of events a race this morning before this race started and another race tomorrow so a very busy weekend at Sebring money well spent coming here for the weekend and you know boys when you look back at last year's result the bmw came here and dominated i think it shows you that there was very little money spent on this car developing it from then on because obviously the budget went into formula one they're probably running very every bit as good as they did last year but audi has put the bar up just a little bit higher and we see a result here of uh, increased competition and just faster racing cars being developed and BMW being left half a step behind. You know, you make a fascinating point, Derek, because throughout the 50s and 60s, so often the winner was the hot car from the year before because the progress technically wasn't that fast and a proven car that had seasoned for a year would be the hot tip. Not so anymore. You better have the hot tip, hot tip. Well, of course, Chris Economaki has made a point for years with me that one of the things that ruins modern racing to him is that you don't have cars that go on year after year after year racing like old Yaller or some other car that some guy raced like four or five times in the Indy 500. I mean, these, these days, you're out to lunch if you don't race, if you keep the thing more than about six months. We do hear that the number 43 car running fourth with uh, Jean-Marc Guignon at the wheel will do a splash and go. Wow. You can see less than four minutes to go, or less than five minutes to go. He will do a splash and go. If he comes in, Alan Decadene is down there to cover us. But that's what we hear on the radios, that he is on his way in. Just to underscore this incredible situation with the Vipers, that they did claim they were going to take a shot at finishing in numerical order, and they are set up to do that, and they're cruising this track uh, together. That is a degree of domination that you rarely see. It occurred with the Ferrari team uh, at Daytona, the 24 hours, uh, back in the late 60s, 69, I think. But uh, it doesn't happen often. The 93 Viper, uh, Ballot, Amarin, and Beltois, of course, had that run-in with Bill Orbelin earlier on and broke that little track rod at the rear end, which they had to change, which is why he's uh, just off the pace a little bit. He's at 317 laps. Uh, the lead cars at 323, and the second car of Archer, Duez, and Donahue is at 322. Mark Donahue had that flat tire as well, and that spin. 43 car did come in, a brief pit stop for a splash of fuel, and he is back out again. Now, with just less than three minutes to go, if it stays as it is, it will only be the second time that three cars have finished on the lead lap. The only other time, believe it or not, was 1990. I remember it well. Right. Who was driving in 1990 then? Your man. 
Jerman. 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 Well, well, well. Well, well, well. Look at Jerman. Some of the other. Look at Jerman here. Don't trip over. Some the of the Royal other. Uh, some of the other close finishers. 55. It was just 25 seconds. 70. 22 seconds. 99. Last year, 9.2 seconds. So it's a close finish, but there have been other close finishes here remarkably after 12 hours. This is a relatively a double at 31 and a half seconds so far. Two and a half minutes. Do they touch? If they didn't touch, they certainly got close. Let's do a little slow more. Look at that again. It certainly was a bit closer. This margin would be the thing you like to see. Fifth closest. This is our leader who took it nice and easy. I think he was waved through. Then it gets close, he pulls over. But now the road goes right and then it goes left. This is tricky. And he's no, out on that. Oh! oh he hit him. He did it. He did. Wow, can you imagine? Boy, there's a that hard way. stop. If that had pushed him up. Well, also, it's terrifying to see all the spectators wow. there. Good Lord, what was he thinking about? That was not good, folks. Remember, so the though, 42 car must have had a splash and go as well. The drivers we've talked to in the last couple of hours have had fatigue etched in their face. Yeah. I mean, not here's surprised. a guy out there who thinks he's just got one more lap to go. He isn't really focusing, maybe. For those of you who have followed the, the progress up today, you've heard Audi, Audi, Audi. Don't forget the name Reinhold Yost. Yost runs this team. Yost, for so many years, ran a Porsche team, a private team that beat the factory. Then he went to Le Mans with hybrid cars, one built by Tom Walkinshaw that Davy Jones drove. There's Reinhold Yost right there. And again, he beat the factory teams. Now he moves over to Audi, and lo and behold, in the second year here at Sebring with these prototype cars, he has a dominant performance. He is to long distance racing what Roger Penske used to be to the Indian. Good point, exactly. Shifting, finding new combinations of drivers and cars, finding a technical edge of some kind or another, and just plain winning races. And Reinhold Yost was a very successful driver in his day before he uh, took to running teams. Which means he understands things like driver comfort. Absolutely. I drove for Reinhold three or four times. In fact, the last professional race I did was for Reinhold Yost at the Dijon round of the World Sports Car Championship in 1990. As it's a timed race, this may be the start of his last lap. I don't think he did enough to get the checkered flag. Is this the start of his last lap? Yes, it is. White flag. One more lap for the Audis. They are running 1-2. And again, watch the pounding these cars take. It seems almost unbelievable that they could have held up through 12 hours of this. They've been forced hard. We said right from the beginning that no one wins Sebring easily because you must attack the track. It's the nature of the beast. They did attack the track, and it was hard fought and well deserved. We had Len Hunt up here early in the show who told us that Audi are doing this to show people just how good and how uh, uh, how much of a high performance vehicle they do make. It's an image creation tool. Audi are so successful. 24 wins, two manufacturers world championship wins in the 80s, eight Trans Am wins with Hurley Haywood, seven wins by Hans Stuck and IMSA in GTO, third and fourth at the first Le Mans in 1999. And now in 2000, its first major endurance victory right here at Sebring, and that bodes very well for what this team might do under the eyes of Speed Vision's 24-hour coverage at the Le Mans 24-hour race. Well, there's no question that as of this moment, Audi becomes the favorite for the 24 hours of Le Mans, which will be held in the middle of June. We hope you'll be with us for that. Not too far to go. Remember, during this race also, there was a mistake made on a yellow flag. Reinhold Yost was absolutely livid that the pace car was allowed to turn its lights off with half a lap to go and caught them out. They had to make a green flag pit stop while the whole field flew by the number 78 car that was leading at the time. They overcame those type of difficulties, put the rest of it together, and here they are. They will take the checkered flag to win the 48th running 
of the Sebring 12-hour race, presented by Dodge this weekend, the Exxon Superflow. There it is. There's the happy team. What an amount of work it is to win one of these long-distance races. Calvin, you're the, right there. We are with Reinhold Yost. What a performance for the team. A 1-2 for Audi Sport. You have to be very happy. Yeah, I'm absolutely happy. It was an exciting race, and uh, I'm very happy also for Audi. Uh, it's a very good car, you know. And uh, so after one, year, after one year with this result, this is unbelievable. To be happy for one team, but the other team, the 77 car, came so close to victory also. Yeah, this okay, it was quite near, but uh, one and second, this is enough, I think. This certainly bodes well for the Le Mans 24 hour coming up in June. Yeah, wait and see. Maybe it, 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 they can do another good job. Great performance this weekend. But me? Great performance this weekend. Congratulations to you and the whole team. Thank you very much. Here comes the Viper Freight train. <laughs> Number 91, 92, and 93, all in a line. Another impressive performance by this Chrysler team, run by Eureka. It is a French-based team that ran mainly in Europe, and this is impressive right here. Boy, I tell you what, it is jolly impressive the way their year is getting up. I mean, they win the Daytona 24-hour race outright, an absolutely clean sweep. The GTS class here at Sebring and pretty pretty well up as well, 7th, 8th and ninth overall, an amazing performance. I just want to say another word about Audi, do you remember last year when there was, um, we didn't know whether a closed car or an open car worked, they built both and ran both cars to prove on the track which was the best, but here's the Vipers, one, two, three. There'll be plenty of French champagne tonight. Hugh Deshonak, who runs this Eureka team. Very, very successful. Well, you see right there, success for two professional managers, team managers, Hugh Deshonak and Reinhold Yost. This is what they do. They manage racing teams professionally for manufacturers, and you can see that it is paid off for the manufacturers who retain them. And there is the fireworks, but remember the GT Winner is about to cross the line also, Dirk Mueller and Lucas Lohr in Dick Barber's car, 20-year anniversary for success for Dick Barber here at, at uh, Sebring. That's pretty good, isn't it, for Dick Barber? I mean, he waits for 20 years. There he is. Winning here and then comes back and wins again. There's the number five car there with Dirk Mueller and Lucas Lohr. The other car, Bob Wallach and Sasha Maschen, uh, not doing so well having that break. There is the Hugh DeShawn. That's Hugh on the left there. He sang a song of the victory podium at Daytona. I wonder if he's going to be a good voice here. Fireworks go up at the end of the Exxon Superflow 12 hours at Sebring, presented by Dodge Weekend. As the cars make their way around, we'll just slip away. We'll be right back to meet the winners. We back OC. <laughs> it is victory celebrations at Sebring. Calvin, get right in the middle there. The Audi team celebrates. Emmanuel Piro, what a performance, guy. You did a tremendous job there in the last stint. I mean, it was a seesaw battle all the way, but you really did a great job there at the end. No, really, I think we all did a good job. I, mean, I have to thank Audi to, to having given us the best car out there. And my teammates, I think we all did 33% of the effort, and that's why we're very, very happy. Last year, we came as a beginners to learn, and uh, it was quite difficult, you know, to see all the others go away. And in uh, 12 months, we've, le we've learned a lot, and we're very, very happy. And I think the thing I liked the most was the applause of the BMW guys when I was passing by. Thank you. It was a great battle. We're going to talk to Frank Beeler next. Frank. Frank. You were here last year. You made such progress in 12 months. Tell us about how you feel and what you think about Le Mans coming up in June. I'm really, really happy. I mean, all the things we found out last season, we really tried to bring it straight into the new car. And it seems it works. Uh, the car is uh, fantastic performance is very very good and we are very optimistic for them all of course. 
about the emotions of the last hour or two. I mean, Alan McNish was doing a great job in the 77 car, and then it all seemed to go away for those guys. It was really very, very hard for us. Uh, I mean, we were quite unlucky in, in a few pit stops before, but then at the end, we had uh, necessary luck, and that's very good. Great job. We're going to try and get in with Tom here. Tom! How about that? You reunite with Yost and you score a victory. You've had a Le Mans win. Now the 12 hour. Yeah, I won here last year. It's back to back win. I won with BMW here and my. I can't believe it. I was so much down before when we had to break, uh, do the break, uh, bleed the brakes and we dropped that back. I, I thought we had lost it there, but it's really up and down today and uh, at the moment I. Perfect. Great job, bye. Thank you. There you have it, guys, from Victory Lane. Tom Christensen had hoped to get break into Formula One this year. It wasn't meant to be, so he signed with Audi. Piero, of course, has been with Audi in the past, and, and, and Bila came from the Audi Super Touring Series. So that's a great result for him and a great boost for his career. Tremendous. He was the British Touring Car Champion in 1995. And, of course, Emmanuel Piero uh, did it, uh, two or three years in Formula One and has driven a lot of touring cars. But this obviously must be a great drive for him in this Audi, which looks like it's going to be strong for the entire year. And it's amazing. They had probably more people here on their team than anybody else here. With the best cars, they handled the best. It just looked easy. A couple of small problems, but that's what you get when you come here with the type of resources they had. They even had the newspaper printed already. I wonder when do they, pr when do they print that? Audi wins Sebring in 2000 congratulations we will be back to meet the other winners of the gts class which was an all audi freight train and then the gt class many many miles but that's where everybody wants to go onto that victory podium it suddenly makes it all worthwhile you forget the aches and pains you forget the blisters you forget the long days and nights because there were quite a few crashes here during practice in particular the audi crashed uh they rebuilt a car overnight one time and now they stand atop the podium but let's go down to our gts winners yes i've got carl Bendlinger here group oliver Be olivier beretta and david donahue Carl, you first. Uh, what a great victory for you. Yes, again, after that, Donald, the second big race we won this year. And I just can do, can say thank you to the team, uh, to the Michelin company, because they supported us with very good tyres again this race. And so, for us, it's not that difficult anymore. If you're such a good, good car and such a good team behind, it's always easier to race. Not that difficult. He said it's not that difficult. How difficult was it for you, Olivier? Oh, it was okay. Uh, I mean, all three drivers did a good job. The car was very reliable. It was like a clock watch. Uh, David uh, came second with his teammate Tommy and uh, Mark Guez have done a great job. We put the three car on the podium and uh, what we, we can have more. David, your thoughts? Would you like to have won it? Well, of course we would have liked to have won it. We were in a really good position until that last yellow flag and that really took us out of contention. We both had uh, brake problems and uh, we were nursing ours along and it got better at the end, but uh, that yellow flag really caught us out. Yeah, you got it. The yellow flag caught them out. So, of course, we have Carl Vendlinger and Olivier Beretta, the winners here. Uh, back to you in the booth. And we had so many replays all day long here. And we caught, of course, David Donahue go off the road backwards a couple of times also. I mean, they had their incidents, but overall, to see those three cars run around uh, one after the other was really quite impressive. It really was. Extraordinarily impressive. There's no doubt about it. As, you, as, as Sam so rightly pointed out, uh, Hugh de Shornak runs that incredible Arika team there in France. Uh, very, very successful over a number of years. This is the first time we've really seen them uh, here at Sebring do so well. But, I mean, what a, what a day. Uh, first, second, and third in numerical order after having won the Daytona 24 hour race outright. So you see the celebrations go on here. We will take another break and we'll be back with some more interviews and get some more of the war stories from the 12 Hours at Sebring. The Exxon Superflow 12 Hours at Sebring is sponsored by Exxon Superflow Motor Oil. Exxon Superflow provides protection that's fast protection that lasts by BMW, the ultimate driving machine.
and by Pirelli and your local Pirelli retailer. Welcome back to the celebrations. Andrew Marriott has our GT class winners. Yeah, I've got Lucas Lure with me here, 20-year-old Lucas Lure, first time here at Sebring. You must be absolutely delighted. Yeah, I'm really, really happy, you know, the first time here in such a big race and then we won it uh, together with Dick Barber Racing and it's also really, really nice because it's a brand new team and Dirk and we and myself, we pushed really, really hard to, to win the race and uh, the car actually was really perfect and everybody's working so hard and it's, it's really, really nice. Lucas, thanks very much. Back to you in the booth. So he says everything was perfect. Remember what happened to his teammate, Bob Wallach? Something happened, obviously, because the rear suspension broke. Sam, you want a quick mention? Well, just very briefly, before we go to the final results, you see the standings there in the first four. We received over 2,400 emails today. The uh, result, this was overwhelming. We hope for a lot more at Le Mans. Good. As you look down to our final standing you see that the, the dodge vipers got all the way up into the top 10 as you look down so not many of these cars finished as you move down to 13 14 15 michelin tires won all three classes we knew they were impressive david from the double and triple stints that we saw earlier a lot of michelin uh, exposure here 17 of the cars here had michelin tires they obviously are very switched on to this type of racing and of course next year 2001 Michelin will be back in Formula One, and I don't expect that will take away from this type of racing at all. It may actually help it. There, it's very disappointed for Boris said Hans Stuck down there in the six car and the ten car. Peter Cunningham blew their engine as well, so both BMW uh, GT cars out very early on. So as you look down through the remainder of the results, I just want to say we had a great day here on Speed Vision. Unprecedented 13 hours of coverage for the 12 hours of Sebring, and you'll see lots more endurance racing on Speed Vision with live coverage of the 24-hour race. It's been a bit of a struggle, but Sam, final impressions? Well, I think there was a gigantic crowd today, and that sense of initiation into a sport may exist for hundreds of people uh, who saw our race for their first time today and will be back because this was a great race. Well, I don't think you could have just seen a better race than this. Absolutely uh, knocked down, drag out affair right from the drop of the flag to the drop of the checkered flag. I think, yes, again, it was another classic. For more information on Sebring or any other motorsports, go to speedvision.com. And I will have to say for Alan Decadene, Steve Evans, Andrew Marriott, Calvin Fish, Jeremy Dale, Greg Creamer, Sam Posey, David Hobbs, and myself, Derry Daly, here in the booth. It has been a pleasure to bring you this special presentation by Speed Vision. Our special guests were Dorsey Schrader, David Murray, and Boris Said, and Hurley Haywood. So long from Sebring, we enjoyed bringing you the presentation.